Greetings, adventure travelers and fellow keepers of the lake. How are you all doing? So, um, as you can see, my signature goatee of the channel is gone because, uh, believe it or not, the government took it. I couldn't do some, like, a b bureaucratic uh, tests or some stuff like that because in my ID, I don't have the goatee and in real world, I, I have. So, they were like, shave it or go and get a new ID with a goatee. And I have my ID since I was like 16. So, yeah. I didn't have any facial hair back then. Anyways, we're here to talk about just that, the government. And not... <laughs> and not, no, we are here to talk about oppression and a game in particular that I was uh, contacted to do, like, not a deep dive, but like um, a review slash, like, give it some love, okay? I, I was uh, contacted to give this game uh, a bit of my time and see, like, wh what I can come up with. It is an asymmetric uh, GM-less game uh, based around the Orwell novels of 1984. So, um, it is set in the present, well, a, a near future type of thing. That's why it's called Oceania uh, 2084. Why is it so hard for me to say Oceania? Oceania, Ocean. Okay, whatever, I, I'll just stick with that, I guess. In the game, there is a lot of creative concepts, there is a lot of new ideas. I think it is very creative and innovative in some ways, but I do have my remarks on it. So, how it all started? Well, Johan Eriksson, he contacted me and he said that he was developing a game for the last four to five years. And now the game is uh, running like a, a Kickstarter. So, if I could have a look and maybe share it with you, someone might find it interesting and back it. And buddy, I hope I pronounced your name well. I don't know my Slavic accent, it, it sometimes happens like this. I, I don't know if my name pronunciation is good. Okay, so I'm very glad that someone contacted me and was like, uh, hey, have a look at, at what I'm doing. I really think it, it is amazing and always, please, always contact me and like uh, share stuff with me. I, I, I always need something to talk about, right? And I love when people do different things and contact me and I just love being treated as a human being instead of like just being a bunch of pixels in between your backlight and the screen glass. So always like contact me, send me stuff, communicate. I'm all for it. Also, another thing, I wasn't paid to say anything good or bad. The game is basically free on itch.io, although there is the Kickstarter. So just go through the, the whole thing, see if you can find something interesting, see if you want to buy the game, check out the game. You can always read the rules on your own. And yeah, let's roll the intro and start digging in and disassembling this thing. I think this uh, whole Orwellian theme hits kind of too close to home in some ways, so we did not really play test the game. I think it is RPG Mainframe episode 65, and it's like timeliness. You don't do more of what you're experiencing in real life in your game. When it was the plague, uh, you didn't do like uh, plague-oriented scenarios in, in your game, because you're kind of fed up with it. Same thing goes with us and these oppressive regimes, so... We didn't play it. Still, I went through the book, I read everything, and I have a couple of notes on this. Let's talk about Johan and what he did in the past. So, Dreams of Fire from Void, that was a 2019 uh, co-op storytelling game that he did. He is a game designer by craft, as uh, if I understood correctly what he was talking about in his video explaining all this. There is also One in a Million Chance of Adventure, which is uh, a TTRPG that he was working on. And there is also a card game that is aimed at like surviving a zombie apocalypse. And there is Control, which is like this this system, it is not really a system, it's not a game, it's more like a framework where you take the emotional snapshot of the character and use that instead of like uh, stats, regular stats to see like what, uh, how the game progresses, uh, have you managed to achieve something or not. So after that, he went into developing the Orwellian uh, game that is Oceania 2084. And in the middle of that system uh, is control. So it is, it is kind of a big thing here. How Johan uh, explains this is that this is a heavy game, this is an emotional game, this is a game where you have to get connections with people, where under the oppressive boot of the regime you still want to like keep close to the ones you love, uh, keep like true inside yourself. They can never make you think something 
if you have the fire inside of you, the connections, the struggle. It should be a story game, it should be an emotional game. Similar to like what I was going for with Cult, but I think this is even more story-based and emotional. This is uh, pretty much a framework for crafting narratives and it really requires a bunch of people to be pretty experienced role players and re pretty into this for the game to work. With a GM-less structure, it invites people that haven't played uh, GM'd games before into playing it, but it also has so much expectations from the players that you need to be experienced to actually enjoy it. So, uh, how the game functions, it is basically for three players up to eight players, where one of the players is actually the big brother. And first of all, like, let's try to divide these two. The big brother, he has the power, but he is just the big brother. He's not the GM, so he's also one of the players. Let's talk about the other players. So how this is all structured is, let's say you have one big brother and five players. Each of the five players uh, chooses a class, and it is not a class in a normal meaning of the word, like a class where in, in like RPGs, it is a socio-economic class. So are you someone that is working, just a working man, or like a working class? Are you a bureaucrat? Are you a party official? And each of those has some levels in between, which kind of gives you a sort of a progression. A side note, there is no really progression here. You're not supposed to live that long, but more on that later. It gives you a bit of a progression where you can gain trust and like go through the levels of, uh, of the authorities and unlock like new things that you can do. Yeah, an important warning is that the more freedom you have as like a party official, for example, the more you will be monitored by the big brothers. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. So as a player, you pick a class, you uh, kind of have this beautiful character sheet that explains where you add which number and then you have your uh, friends and family. You should name a couple of friends in your family. It gives you like leverage, uh, backup characters in case you are vaporized. So you would like pick some of those. And also it gives you like some RP um, chances with other uh, players. So uh, it also gives the leverage to the big brother to torture you with like uh, threatening your friends and family. So add a couple of these, these are fine and then you're pretty much set to go. You have, as you see here, a couple of like values, national values and your personal values listed and you kind of just pick a couple that you think are great, pick a couple that you think are not great and that will influence your emotions and all that. It does sound a bit complicated at first because it, we're not talking about strength, dexterity or things like that. We're talking about emotions and values. But what is important here is to have that campfire approach where you and all the players uh, sit around the table and really go into like understanding that uh, family, understand th that group of friends, understand each other's characters because this is pretty much the whole game is laying on the role playing legs if you can if that's if that's a way to call it but like imagine like uh, a book of role playing uh, on top of some legs so okay you have the players uh, you have the big brother we will talk about big brother uh, in a sec but you have the players and what now well the game is structured as we said without a dm so what do you do well each of the players can uh, have a couple of acts per uh, like phase of the day and each session is like pretty much one day so you have like that session cut into phases which is interesting and for each of those phases you have acts so for example uh, everything starts with the morning the sun comes up everything is beautiful right so uh, the day starts with a broadcast from the big brother who basically goes into like uh, we have even more war but we are cutting budgets here but we are making uh, modifications there all hail big brother yay and you're supposed to like watch that or just hear uh, the big brother player like recite that and then uh, you have three acts per player and one act is describing like an action or a situation more uh, more or less uh, that that lasts around up to 10 minutes i think you can go clockwise or whatever so i start and i say okay i get up in the morning i go to my tv i hear the broadcast i hear they're doing budget cuts to the factory and i work there so this makes me sad so uh when you have a situation like this you don't roll to see if you accomplish something you actually are more like reactive to the world not proactive the world does something or you want to do something within the world then the world responds and you roll to see how that affects your emotional snapshot that 
you're trying to model with your character sheet. So uh, you would do this through, like I would have a couple of acts, you would have a couple of acts, Joe would have a couple of acts, and then we would say the morning phase is over. During these acts, it is uh, like almost impossible for you to not commit uh, a thought crime. Anything that the big brother says is a thought crime. He's carefully listening for what you're doing and he's rolling to any time you commit a thought crime, but the dice say if you are like observed doing it. And this gives the the big brother uh, some suspicion points and he can like work with that to do a thing or two to the other players. So for now, let's just continue. So you have the morning phase, you have the work phase, then lunch, then work again, leisure time and night sleep. And during this, you will communicate with other players. You will be hiding notes, uh, finding out, out secrets and stuff and like trying to make a difference in the world. So you see here, it is a very restrictive environment. So you need to really like put everything you have into role play and like try to circumvent anything that could be like a thought crime. It starts to be a game of like wits. And I think it is interesting. Where I find a problem here is that it is strictly said in the book that you don't, you can't win this game. So you win if you have like a, a good story, a good emotional thing. And I think you need to have some form of a personal goal or something so you can win. I would say that you need some form of scenario or module or something to tell you like for you personally, you get like some form of a job or some form of a quest that you're trying to accomplish. And this is where the DM role usually comes in, right? So without that, you need to have like at least a part of the book that talks about this. And I maybe I missed it. Maybe I really did. It just said try to simulate living and working and like resisting the suppression and the story will emerge on itself, which might be true. Again, I haven't played it, so I don't know. Ah, one more thing that I forgot to say is that NPCs in this game are role played by anyone. So if you have your, uh, for example, family members come into the, the scene, the act, I can take uh, like control of one of them, the other, the Joe can take the control of the other one. And we can all have a conversation in character, which if you have watched my uh, roleplay beyond your character video, which is an old video, but I think there is a thing or two said that I still agree with in that video. And here the big brother player, he can only roleplay the evil NPCs. So that makes sense. Okay, so uh, the emotion system, this is how this works. So uh, as I said, you have a snapshot of your emotions, which are, uh, I will put it on the screen, that these and you have your national and personal values. So whenever your personal or national values are tested, you do what's called a value test. And each of these values, as you can see, has a corresponding emotion. So if you have the value marked as good, you're aiming to roll above the number that is currently noted for that emotion. If you have the value labeled as bad, you need to roll below. And now what this does is you see if you have passed and that influences the level of uh, how much you feel that certain emotion. If you fail, you have an emotional outburst, which you like correlate to a couple of different uh, options for emotional outbursts. And that can also influence, as you can see, you have shadow emotions, which are like, if you fail this emotion, then the other two emotions that are listed here, they get bumped up by one point. So it is kind of like an emotional roller coaster here. Yeah, the system itself sounds pretty interesting. Not to, to get into traumatic memories and like uh, good memories and how that affects everything. Uh, I think the emotional system is is a bit contradictory to what the game is about. For me personally, if I see that I have an emotional snapshot of my character, I would try to roleplay that. And if something changes and I don't feel it, whenever you have dissonance between what is a snapshot on your character sheet and what is in your uh, soul, your heart, your embodiment of the, the role, uh, I think that causes friction. I see where this is going and, and I loved the approach. I personally think that it is so innovative to go into emotions instead of stats and try to like manipulate the world with emotions and not stats. I think it is, it is ingenious. But whenever you're trying to have like emotional outbursts or dramatical change of the state 
of the character like this, it shouldn't have this many uh, moving parts. For example, okay, you have in called stability. Your stability goes down, you get like just a description of how you feel. Um, in Call of Cthulhu, when you go insane. It is a drastic change of your uh, player's personality, but it makes sense because it is just one number. And yeah, I think like having each value tied to an emotion that's tied to more emotions and, and each of those causes like an emotional outburst that can make you like vaporized. Uh, it is it is maybe too, too big of a death spiral, I think, and too big of an ask from, from your players. Right, so let's talk about uh, what, how it is to run the Big Brother. So if you're the Big Brother player, you have the ability to come up with your own thought crime, to come up with your own party, your own thing. And I think that is great. I think that is phenomenal. And, and you see the players like uh, starting to figure out how it all like connects together and what they're trying to, the, to circumvent. Uh, I think that's great. And the Big Brother in the book is described as someone who is basically playing a strategy game, but I don't really see it here because you are the om omnipotent, so you're bound to win. Now, you're discouraged from being a DM, so you can't say, okay, I can manipulate the narrative a bit so that it's more tense or uh, a better story. I don't know if that is a part of the book. I got the impression that you are rolling to see whenever you hear a thought crime being committed, you're rolling to see if you notice it. And then if you notice it, you get some suspicion points, similar to holds and, and like moves in uh, like, cult and like it is somewhat in inspired by powered by the apocalypse system but i get the idea that you as a big brother don't have that many things to do you have a lot of things that you can do but they all lead to the same thing uh torture someone uh, until he snitches or vaporize him and uh, to come to that point you just need to gather enough evidence and you're pretty much having to just make a role for it. And that role is modified by what the players are doing, how trusted they are, uh, what their like uh, stats are, and is modified by some of your things. At the end of the day, it's a dice roll. You're doing that one dice roll and hope, in hoping to get suspicion points where you can interrogate someone. And interrogations, they always like happen at night. It is described as like people coming to your uh, room. You just open your eyes and see people around your bed with like a flashlight in your face. And okay, they you uh, go with them and the interrogation, it should be like done from the side of like Big Brother and the evidence that was gathered against you and you have to like pass a bunch of value tests or snitch to be able to like survive this or you're vaporized, like a single failed value test will vaporize you. And here, wow, it is so brutal. Like if you come to this point, I guess it's like the end of the game. Uh, like the, the last chance for you to survive is if you like really do all the value tests right. And there is a thing that like balances how many value tests you should do uh, in like, from the severity of your crime and like other things. All in all, if you pass this test, if you pass the investigation, your trust levels rise, your hope levels rise. And uh, yeah, you have a system of hope and love and pretty much love uh, helps you like reroll or boost uh, value rolls. And hope is, I think, used for doing like class related stuff, I think. Honestly, my opinion is that yeah, it could be fun uh, with a group that is like on your level and you're all uh, like in this constant uh, like one-upping of intellectual um, debate in between yourselves. I think for that sort of group, being the big brother would be interesting because the three of them are trying to like uh, take their resources and be better than you. And I, I think there is something to it. But then it's uh, an adversarial uh, place where you are not feeling oppressed if you can be on par with the big brother and the whole idea here is to feel oppressed. Honestly, I would rather play as a player than a big brother. And I've asked a couple of my players as well and they're all like, yeah, we would rather be players. We would rather be oppressed than be the oppressor, not because we're all kinky and like, like the sub stuff, but because it just has more fun mechanics. So in my opinion, I would just remove the big brother as a player and I would make it something that the game does. For example, uh, this is just my idea and feel free to add me as a contributor in the second edition <laughs> if you like it. Like whenever you would roll to see if the thought crime was observed, I would have a deck of cards with like, I don't know, 50 something cards. Let's say one third of them are, or you would adjust for mathematical statistical stuff, but I would have them uh, some are blue, some are red, and for the severity of your crime and how, uh, like, 
how observed it was like were you outside were you inside were you with someone were you under uh, a security camera or whatever i would have you draw a different number of cards to your like deck and each sleeping phase i would have you like just count how many red cards you have if you have i don't know like more than what your trust value uh, permits you get the interrogation then you have to roll value tests which is something that you do anyways and then you see if you're vaporized or not there is a very interesting thing for the players to fight back to to somehow change the world in a meaningful way and that is we are what we leave behind that is one of the core principles here uh, here it is implemented as notes and notes are basically physical notes that you write and then you hide them. You can hide them as a player somewhere or you can keep them with yourself. If you hide them, then later if you're vaporized and another uh, of your characters uh, is like walking, they should describe how they stumble onto a note and the note gives them hope, so that's good. Uh, when you write a note and keep it with yourself, whatever is written in the note, as long as it's like following the story and is plausible, is true. So you can warp reality with these notes and when you hide them they lose that uh, power for you but maybe someone else finds them as hope currency. So I think this is something that I was like very very um, excited about. The note system is so good. Like I would put it in cult, I would put it in Call of Cthulhu, I would put it everywhere. It has so much power but if they, for example, uh, don't use it and uh, they are caught with it, that note goes to the big brother and then he can use that as like a plus bonus thing in his uh, interrogations. And those notes somewhat dictate like the value test that you would be taking. So I think the note system is great. And it emphasizes one thing that Yuan says in his uh, video, and I will link the video in the description, of course. But he says that this is designed to be played as a roguelike, which is also interesting. I really like the idea, but the book also states that the game should be played for four to six sessions, which I don't agree with. I think this is best to be done as one shots. I think maybe two sessions, three max, I would say, if you even survive three sessions. But I would say it is it should be short bangers and each time you can restart the same scenario, like the same personal goals, you can like uh, make them repeat either through notes, either through like the deal you make with your uh, other players. It is interesting for you to try to solve the same problem from like different angles as different um, social uh, classes like with different permissions and uh, authorities, then it, it makes leaving those notes worth it and you can make uh, infinite amount of notes. Uh, every one of those uh, like is risky to make, but you can make a bunch of notes and leave them and then follow that breadcrumb trail and, and with careful planning and emotion management, I think you can create a pretty interesting uh, scenario but it kind of contradicts what the game is about right because then you are not doing emotions and role-playing then you're doing min-maxing in the book um well basically i i'm okay with the structure i would honestly say that the value tests and how they are connected to emotions is a bit scattered through the book but once you get the hang of it it is fine the book is manageable i don't know how it is in the kickstarter version don't call, quote me on this this is what i found on itch so yeah i didn't look at the a5 printable version i looked at the version b before that so it's the older version some slight things have been changed in the meantime so yeah keep an eye out for that but overall like i really like that you have listed which chapters are uh, needed for which characters so that you can read those and focus on those and you can start playing right away you don't have to go through the whole book and the whole book has around uh, 100 pages which is certainly nice in the book you have some bare bones setting uh, material, you have some information about how to lay um, down some like ministries and, and how to create the vibes. So there is something like broad strokes, but there is something along those lines to help you out. It doesn't have a setting of its own because it should be like you should project your own dystopia onto this, which is cool again. Uh, I'm sad that I didn't see more sci-fi things since it is well, the big brother is the AI here, but it, I think 
Uh, it is a kind of unused potential. So, um, I've been all over the place here. I didn't go into my usual, uh, let's feel the vibe of the game. Let's. I feel this is more of a, like a mechanical breakdown of a certain system. And I like it like that. Uh, I think this game needed to hear this. I'm not afraid to say my opinion, quite the, the contrary, but I'm not bashing on the creator. I think there is potential. I think this game is fun for someone. Those people are just not me and my friends because it hits too close to home and with all the other games that we're playing and with me being uh, a passionate GM, I don't see uh, us picking up this game. Then I see this as something that I would run more as a horror game and this game explicitly says it is not a horror game and it should go through like blandness and, and like oppression. I want to start this discussion with uh, a little anecdote from my life, right? Me and my fiance, we are big theater lovers. So whenever there is a chance and we like find some uh, good plays, we go and check it out. And the last play we went to coincidentally was based on the Orwell's novel. And the thing was, the play was garbage. Like it was so bad. Uh, it was so boring. Like you would, uh, you would be looking at their day-to-day -day life, and there was like some uh, spark of resistance that is going like against the big brother. But the whole point uh, of the play was for you to sit and look at something that's like literally shaving your brain cells off of your brain. I don't know. It was so fucking bad. During the whole play, there was like a TV screen uh, on the um, on the floor uh, and it was rotated towards the, the actors. At the end of the play, the actors didn't like come out to bow or anything. They just one of the actors came out and turned the TV screen towards us. And there was this woman that was like just staring at us. And through the, the show, you kind of get the idea that on the screen, the, the, the face that you're looking at is the face of the party. It's the face of the big brother. It's what's uh, doing the surveillance. So now it's looking at you and the people are looking at the screen and they're waiting for like the actors to come out and bow. That's, that's how it goes, right? Before you go home. The Zoomers started to figure out this pretty fast because their attention span is pretty much uh, the length of one TikTok, which is kind of like 30 seconds or something. The younger audience started to like stand up and leave. And then the older audience caught like what's happening and they left as well. When you exit the theater, and this was the best thing, when you exit the theater, on the building, there is the projection of the same woman, the big brother. It's still watching. The, the whole point of the show was to leave. It was the, the whole point. The play um, got like so much meaning and weight and everything when you got the punchline, basically. You were supposed to leave. You, you, wouldn't, you weren't supposed to conform, but you did and you lost two hours of your time because you were thought to follow the herd. Blandness in a game uh, around the table uh, for players that have like taken out of their time to, to fight oppression, uh, it can be fun. But if you're strictly trying to roleplay that and you're trying to invoke like the turmoil within that is powering the resistance through blandness, I don't think blandness can boost your turmoil, inner turmoils in a couple of hours of play. I think that is something that happens from years and years passing living under the oppression until someone stands out and says, I'm willing to fight for this. So horror and oppression in terms of like violence and like in terms of personal loss are some topics that I would more uh, rather uh, use as like driving forces here. Still, I love that Johan has made uh, this game and I dare say it is an experimental game. I love people experimenting and pushing the hobby further. I think anyone who supports people like Johan that want to make stuff should back this game, even though it has some things that should be fixed. I mean, let's be let's be real. Even like D&D has things that should be fixed. We homebrew a lot. We homebrew everything. But I think it is important to have courage to come out with some completely different ideas. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming to me and, and for actually like believing that I will do something with this. 
I know this is not an advertising. I know it doesn't fill the, the category of like um, a review or, or anything. This is just feedback, one uh, designer to another. Uh, make a lighter system, make the second edition. And I will certainly back the second edition, I promise you that. But like, see how to make this, if you want it to be more uh, oriented towards story and role playing, make it more accessible to people that are uh, not that good at role playing. And keep the modifications of the character sheet to the minimum so no like every time i roll a die i have to change something on the character sheet that is bad i hope this video brings you some like backers yay we're doing that youtuber promotion stuff done in the worst way possible uh yeah and now my own youtuber promotion stuff subscribe to this channel and check out my other links and stuff I am baffled how well this is going. Honestly, I have no idea how my channel got so much attention from some people that are pretty much my idols, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the content from here on out will be mostly uh, not videos like this. Expect an update in the form of community posts soon, and I will explain everything that is coming. And as always, keep on going, keep on loving, keep on being creative, design more games, and I will see you in the next one. Farewell, keepers.